afternoon to you with Dr. I am Dr. Erica, a GP from the West Midlands, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Linda, emergency medicine physician from Sheffield, and we're both lifestyle medicine doctors. Oh, hello, hello. So lovely to see so many guests who have reappeared. Dr. Hans, hello, Janet. Hi, how are you guys doing? And so lovely to see so many new guests as well. If you're new to us, please introduce yourself and let us know where you're tuning in from and what is your favorite hot cup of tea, or maybe it's an iced tea if you're in California. Um, if you're new to our show, we would love to introduce you to our mission, which is to create events where we can bust medical misinformation and allow for community building. We host afternoon tea with docs every Sunday at 5 p.m. UK time, where you can connect with world-renowned lifestyle medicine experts like our guest today, Professor Michael Goran. We share daily practices that you can help uh, to address chronic diseases in a very practical manner that you can start introducing to your life right away. Each afternoon tea event is divided into two parts. The first hour is a live interview accessible to all on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And the second half is a little bit more intimate and uh, more personable because it's not a live streamed and it only happens on uh, Zoom for those who have joined us here. So here you can ask questions from our experts privately and share your story. And if you want to take this journey further and you are ready to implement your health goals, join our free membership on our website to be part of our supportive community to start crushing chronic diseases so that you can live a long and fulfilling life. Today we're speaking to Professor Michael Goran about how sugar is silently damaging our children's health and what we can do about it. Dr. Michael Goran is the Programme Director for Diabetes and Obesity Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and the Sabin's Re Sabin Research Institute Professor of Pediatrics and Atkins Endowed Chair in Pediatric Obesity and Diabetes Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California. His research has focused on the causes and consequences of childhood obesity for 30 years and has over 350 published peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Goran co-authored the incredibly informative book, Sugar Proof, that illuminates the link between dietary sugar and the physical, metabolic, behavioral and learning problems that are plaguing our children. And that shows parents how to successfully sugar-proof their children for a healthier start in life. Sugar Proof talks about how sugar puts your kids at risk of hyperactivity, tantrums, learning problems, digestive troubles, overactive fat cells, chronic disease and more, and what you can also do about that. So welcome, Professor Boran. Welcome. Thank Thanks. you so much. Oh, pleasure to be here. Lovely to be here. Hi, everybody. And uh, looking forward to uh, a great discussion. So thanks for having us on and thanks for letting everybody know about Sugar Proof. <laughs> Thank you so much for dedicating 30 years of your life to educate us on sugar and how we can protect ourselves and learning about what it is and how our environment is constantly feeding our children. This book is fascinating. We have read it, reread it, highlighted it and shared a lot of notes on it. Uh, we are really excited about it and we can't wait to ask more questions about it. But before that, um, we would love to know what uh, stimulated you to write this book. Yeah, I, th I think it was a variety of factors. Um like we were talking about before we came on. Uh, and as you mentioned, I've been doing this research for 35 years actually, um, published hundreds and hundreds of papers, done great work, um, worked with some amazing people around the world who've also done great research. And I felt compelled because the information we were gathering and finding was so useful to the public but yet the research kind of gets buried in, 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 in the literature. And there's you know, typically a 10, 15, 20 year gap between the research and what you 
Erica and Linda are facing every day as uh, lifestyle medicine doctors and ER doctors. So we wanted to kind of, we wanted to accelerate that knowledge translation um, to make the information more possible. I think the research that we were doing started to tell a very, very compelling story uh, with very clear implications. And it was a story that had to be told. And it's been um, a, a wonderful process to kind of get that out there and write it out and translate it in, in, into practical information. Absolutely. And as you just mentioned, there is at least 20 to 25 years gap between the scientists and what you produce, your incredible work, and how we practice medicine. And that's why we are so passionate about sharing your science with our guests and also with our colleagues. And you asked a very poignant question when you started this research, and that was, what exactly are in products that our children love and that we are routinely feeding them. And your findings were shocking. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you found? Yeah, so this, it started because we were trying to do dietary analysis. So we're trying to make um, sense of dietary reports. So a, a child or a parent reports they eat X, Y, and Z products. And then we try to run that through our software and spit out grams of sugar, grams of fat and all that. But at the end of the day, we didn't really know the main constituents of things like soda and juice, how much sugar is actually in a juice and what type of sugar, because we can, became very interested in different types of sugars, glucose and fructose. And we can talk more about that in detail later. Uh, things that aren't directly disclosed on the ingredient lists so high fructose corn syrup, for example, is a mixture of different sugars. So this was the most basic study of all that we've done in 35 years, which involved going shopping, um, buying products at the grocery store, going getting products from the gas station, um, fountain drinks from the movie theaters, all kinds of sources. And we had them analyzed in a lab, blinded to the lab and said, okay, tell us exactly what's in here in terms of the sugar content. Um, and what we found was that the actual sugar content varied um, quite a bit relative to what was disclosed on the label, plus or minus. But the most interesting thing was that there was consistently more fructose in those products than we had believed up front based on what the food industry was telling us. Um, food industry fought back against that told us we were flawed scientists, asked us to retract our paper. Um, so we did the study again. This time we sent the samples to three different uh, research labs, had them analyze three different ways, put all the results together, and again, came up with this pretty consistent finding. Mostly that high fructose corn syrup based beverages, which the industry says is only 55% fructose, um, and is negligibly more fructose than in regular sugar, we found much more than 55% fructose. And th this was important because the research was showing that it's for kids who are growing, it's fruct the more fructose that they're consuming, the more you tip the balance towards the adverse effects of sugar. So it turns out that even a small difference in the amount of fructose can make a big impact. So these are products that we are feeding our children every day. They're accessible to them at school, in the, um, when they go to training, when they go out for maybe a movie. All of these foods that you have studied are easily accessible to them and uh, they kind of engulf their environment, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not just high fructose corn syrup. Most people know to look for that now, but we're talking about energy drinks, which are used uh, fairly widely. Other healthy sounding products like juice, uh, which are also high in fructose, regardless of high fructose corn syrup, just because fruit liberate, sugar is liberated from fruit is high in fructose. And 70% uh, of processed foods now in the US is probably higher, 
and probably similar in the UK, have added sugar and 80% of foods targeted towards children have some type of added sugar. So it's, it's, it's more sources of added sugar that are readily available with different types of sugar in them. And you have shared the story of uh, two uh, teenagers. One is Melissa and Marco. Both were athletic kids. One of them, Marco, was a little, maybe a little bit um, on the heavier side, but uh, both of them looked like normal teenagers. And um, we understand that Marco, unfortunately, at a young age of 17, was actually diagnosed with fatty liver disease. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And um, why did he develop fatty liver disease at such a young age? Yeah, and unfortunately, we see it in even younger kids. And we only found that because he was part of a research study. Um, but yeah, so most liver disease up until about 10, 15 years ago was related to alcohol. Um, and we have a new disease now called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the reason we're seeing more of that is because of greater sugar consumption and fructose in particular. So alcohol uh, is, is taken up by the liver and the liver kind of detoxifies the alcohol out of the blood, just like the liver is this giant filter that removes all the toxic elements from the blood, uh, alcohol being one of them. And what the liver does with that alcohol converts it to fat and produces a lot of inflammation byproducts. So that buildup of fat in the liver can become very harmful and affect the ability of the liver to function, meaning that it will not be able to properly filter the blood for, for toxic compounds. Well, now what we've learned is that fructose is handled by the liver in almost exactly the same way as alcohol. Uh, so some people have said that uh, fruct fructose or fruit juice, juice high in fructose is like alcohol, but without the buzz. Uh, you don't get the buzz from the alcohol, but the liver clearly does not, the body does not want fructose to get beyond the liver. And the liver takes up about 90% of the fructose that comes in, especially when it's coming in in large amounts and it converts it to fat. That fat can get stuck in the liver, cause fatty liver disease, but the byproducts of that are also not good. Inflammation, uric acid production. And if the fat doesn't get stuck in the liver, it gets repackaged into triglycerides and other lipids and sent out into the blood. So that's the basis or the origin of this lipidemia. So when we talk about, sorry, when we talk about fructose, um, if we, our guests uh, are not aware of it, maybe, um, when we have fructose in the form of fruits, it is very different than when we are actually consuming it through uh, uh, sugary drinks. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more why is that? Yeah, absolutely. This is important because when I, you know, when I go off in my fructose bandwagon, uh, some people love say, "Oh, he's saying fructose is bad, so I shouldn't eat fruit." Uh, that's not not at all the case, because this process of how the liver handles fructose is based on concentration of fructose and how rapidly it's coming in. So when you, if you're eating an apple, for example, uh, which it has fructose in it. Um, that fructose is released slowly because of the fibers that come along with it. And um, under those conditions of a slow release situation, uh, the gut can actually convert some of that fructose into glucose. Uh, and um, it can bypass this pathway of uh, converting to fat. So eating an apple is very different from when you put an apple through a juicer um, and you extract the juice and you liberate the sugars. So when you juice an apple, first of all, if you drank a glass of apple juice, it would be the equivalent of three apples. So you've automatically got three times as much fructose in a glass of apple. Nobody's eating three apples all at once, um, but you would be drinking the juice of three apples. But, and then you've thrown away the fiber and you drink those three apples in about five minutes. So it's a very rapid acting situation where you where you overwhelm 
um, those capacities to convert to glucose, you overwhelm um, the protective pathways and the fructose just it's, doesn't want all that fructose getting around. So that's when it takes it out of the, of the blood, uh, filters it out of the blood and converts it to fat. So very two very, very different situations and it, uh, of liberating the juice from an apple and drinking it and eating an apple, chewing it, getting the fiber and all the other phytonutrients. Mm -hmm. And the question in the box, what about smoothies? That's in the middle. And that's a great question because, and I'm a great fan of smoothies uh, or, or just baking with apples, using it as a sweetener, because again, you use the whole apple. So if you want to throw some whole fruit into a smoothie, um, at least you're still getting all the nutrients in that fruit. You're still getting the fiber and, and you can control what's going in there. You can supplement it with some more fiber if you want, or some more protein. So some people will argue, I've heard this argument, oh, smoothies, if you, if you, if you blend it too much, you'll shred the fibers and you'll remove the, 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 the protection from the fibers. I don't know. That's going a bit too far. I don't, I don't want to think that too deeply about it. Um, and maybe uh, my answer would be, okay, just don't blend it as much um, or add some flaxseed just in case you want some more fiber. So I think there's ways around that. So I'm a firm believer um, smoothies are okay. Again, you're not putting three apples into your smoothie, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're putting chunks of frozen fruit or a banana or something like that. So I think that's perfectly okay. Just to recap on that. So when fructose in large quantities are coming to your body, our body is actually not able to use fructose as energy. Um, our body is able to use glucose as energy, but not fructose. So when we eat an apple and we break it, break it uh, down into fiber, slow releasing the fructose, our microbiome is actually able to break down fructose into glucose and, uh, and organic acids. And then this glucose then goes on and um, is, uh, is um, you utilized as energy in our muscle or wherever we need it. But when we do drink a big glass of uh, fructose, uh, high uh, ener energy drink or sugary drinks, unfortunately, it bypasses our microbiome and it goes straight into our liver. And in our liver, it is transformed into fat, right? And what yes. happens to this fat from the liver? Well, they get released into the circulation and they start circulating around the blood and I mean, could indirectly be used for, for energy from the fat, but it, it basically, it's the starting point um, of dyslipidemia, of the buildup of fats in the blood. So uh, this is a surprising fact that dyslipidemia is not necessarily directly always related to dietary fat. Dietary fat may contribute somewhat to dyslipidemia, but sh sugar most definitely does, especially if it's high in fructose. So there's a connection between dietary sugar and dyslipidemia, high, high levels of lipids in your blood. So in Marco's case, not only was he already now at high risk of needing a liver transplant because his liver was full of fats, and let's mention um, that you wrote he ate up to 100 grams of sugar a day for a 17 year old. And um, not only did he already have a fatty liver disease, but also he was now predisposed to heart disease, type 2 diabetes early on in his age uh, due to this dyslipidemia and uh, high sugar in his bloodstream. Um, so if we if you have such high fructose intake, as, um, as in, in the case of Marco and many more examples, um, how, could we, how could we protect our kids uh, from uh, taking in such a high fructose levels? What should they be looking out for? Well, in terms of fructose itself, I mean, juice is a major culprit. Uh, juice often is thought of as a healthy, beverage. Um, some juices are higher in fructose than others. So for example, apple juice uh, is 70% fructose. Actually, the fructose content of apple juice is higher than high fructose corn syrup, but it's called fruit juice. 
So it should be called high fructose fruit juice. But um, so that's a main source. Orange juice is about the same as ordinary sugar. It's about 50-50. Uh, that's not to say you can never have a glass of fre fresh squeezed orange juice ever again. Um, but just, I think we should be aware that it's not the healthy everyday drink that we think it is, especially um, the apple juice and the high fructose uh, sugars. Um, so I would, I would, that's the main source and a high fructose corn syrup. I think the word is out on that, I think. Um, in terms of looking for it on an ingredient list and trying to avoid it. But fructose or fruit-based sugars are becoming more popular. So you'll even see uh, crystalline fructose or fructose listed as a, as a, as a sugar or, or, or fruit juice concentrates as an added sugar. I mean, those are very high in fructose and are actually worse and more damaging than ordinary sugar because they have more, more fructose in them, but they sound healthy. So the, the food industry has done a good job because they've found over 200 different ways to name and make sugar, uh, including um, fruit-based sugars. But you know, cane sugar is also a fruit-based sugar. It comes from sugar cane or from, from, from sugar beets. So um, they are all kind of grown in nature, but have different amounts of fructose. So I would watch out for the fructose-based, fruit-based sugars, try to avoid them. And before we go on on um, sweeteners and low calorie sugars, I would love to share statistics. And by the way, your book is full of so many stats and so much good data um, that in 1750, we only eat 1.8 kilogram of sugar per uh per year and unfortunately by 2000 this went up to 68 kilo of sugar a year and um that translates to about um 45 uh, teaspoon per day uh on average in in america and it's not very far in the in the uk as well and um also the fructose intake has gone up from a low 12 grams to 70 grams of fructose which is just shocking and all of this is without us really knowing that we are in the danger of eating so much sugar if we are not um attentive uh, to our environment um you have talked about the uh, food uh, desserts um, in the UK as well as in the US where whilst we are trying to be attentive to what we eat very often unfortunately it's very difficult to access healthy food uh, fresh fruits and vegetables um, and you share the story um, of one of your patients who described their environment could you tell us what are food deserts and how it impacts our food choices yeah, so food food deserts would be uh, regions of the city or the country where you don't have ready access to healthy foods. Uh, so we're talking about kids who, you know, their 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 typical source of buying food might be a corner grocery store or even a gas station. Um, they don't have ready access. And of, of course, this is also tied up in economic issues because typically healthier foods tend to be more expensive. Um, and so food, well, you have the you have the book in front of you, you have the statistic, I can't remember it, but um, I, I have the book in front of me too, but you, you have it all highlighted. So what is the percentage? I think it's pretty striking number of pretty striking percentage of the US population live in food deserts that do not have ready access to- so 1.2 million in the UK uh, population uh -huh. does not have access to it. Um, and in the US- It's 20%. 20%. Yeah. But yeah, I was thinking, that's the number I was thinking. So still, had that number retained there, yeah. So yeah, it, it's um, it's a it's it's a concern, um, for sure. And um, this brings me on to mention that uh, the, the next research where you highlighted that 
uh, your findings show that fructose uh, to the unbeknown mother who is carrying their baby and then who is breastfeeding is constantly um, in the close nearby environment for the mom to maybe eat something or drink something with fructose, unbeknowing that actually this fructose affects the child from a very, from actually a conception point of view. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that research and um, how it's affecting our our uh, children's development from from conception. Sure. Yeah. So we we call this the developmental origins of disease, and nutrition plays a critical role. So the, the the growing fetus is dependent on the mother for nutrition, obviously. Um, and many studies have shown that excess sugars and fructose, in particular during during pregnancy, can affect the developing fetus and that's that's not to say if you're a pregnant mom you should never eat sugar because if you're a pregnant mom you know it's very hard to be told what to eat or what not to eat but um watch out for that sweeteners also which we're going to talk about soon i hope um i think in general even during pregnancy if someone's saying oh don't eat as much sugar the answer is not alternative sweeteners like sucralose or stevia, because those also can have impacts on the fetus. So I think both are both both should be uh, not completely avoided, but certainly watched out for and limited as much as as possible. And you we, mentioned we coined, we coined the term secondhand sugars is what, what a, a new term we came up with just to, to kind of raise awareness that sugars that you're consuming um, can affect the de unknowingly, as you say, the developing uh, fetus or the developing infant through breast milk. Yes, and you mentioned that fructose actually changes the stem cells. So, so stem cells are master cells that change into specific cells as the child develops um, into brain cells, liver cells, pancreatic cells, and so on. Um, and uh, you wrote that um, stem cells, when they meet fructose at this developmental stage, actually uh, it prompts it to turn into fat cells. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's the research. That paper blew my mind when I first read it um, because it's a, it was a. It, we didn't do this study that that was that was done in it by a different researcher but it's a basic science study that basically just um incubated stem cells with different sugars and different concentrations of sugars and showed that even minute concentrations of fructose um very very small levels were able to change the fate of developing stem cells amazing um and so when you're a fetus or when you're a developing infant, you have a lot of stem cells that are have not yet decided what they're going to be when they grow up. And that decision making can be altered by even low amounts of fructose. So even even though we said most fructose is filtered out of the blood by the liver, um, even if a small amount of it gets into the circulation or into breast milk, which we've also shown happens if, you, if, if you're nursing and you're consuming too much fructose, even those small amounts could have alter, alterations, impactful effects on development. That's why it's so important to be conscious of our environment. And in the book, you lay it out so nicely how to be conscious with a healthy mindset um, and address these issues. So by having education around the topic, I think that this book just empowers everyone to make much more um, uh, informed decisions because our environment is it is dangerous. It is important to be know about it, but not to be alarmed because when we know the uh, how, then it becomes much easier um, to do so. So we we talked about stem cells and how they actually change um, change once uh, through the development, but also we would love to talk a little bit more about the um, well sweeteners, uh, low calorie sugars. Uh, which has sneaked into our lives for, uh, for the last uh, couple of years. And what are your thoughts on them? I, I very much think they're a fool's gold. I think they're very problematic. I think they sound good. Um, they deliver 
sweetness without the calories, uh, but it's, it's, it's a false sense of, of security. Um, I think the big problem with the diet today is not just sugar, but sweetness. Um, I think food companies and individuals might hear about cutting sugar and then think about replacing them with alternative sweeteners. Um, but really there's problems there. I mean, studies show that if you are habitually consuming sweeteners as part of your diet, you actually may end up, well, you do end up eating more calories and more sugar throughout the day. So it doesn't resolve this craving that we have uh, for sweetness. Um, so for example, if you have a box of cookies and they, they're, they're sugar-free with stevia or sucralose or whatever, you might end up eating three or four of those cookies instead of one or two. Um, so that means you're, you're going to actually consume more calories. Even though that one cookie has less calories than this other cookie, you may end up eating four of these cookies versus two of these cookies. So you've ended up eating a lot more calories. And that's what the research shows. And you know, second of all, to me, there's a pleasure issue, a taste issue, because I don't like the taste of those sweeteners. I don't like the taste of any of them. Well, there's one I don't mind the taste of, which is allulose, which we can talk about later. But most of the most common ones, sucralose, ASK, even stevia, the natural occurring ones, monk fruits, very popular here in the US. It's probably coming soon in the UK. Just doesn't taste good. So if I'm going to bake a cake or a tray of cookies for me and my kids, I'd much rather bake a tray of cookies that I'm going to enjoy and like the taste of um, and just use less sugar. And I think you highlighted the grave dangers of them as well when you mentioned that yes they are low calorie but they work on the same receptors uh, as sugar so they actually change the brain's requirements and um, it kind of um, we would i would love to address the addictive issue of them and how it changes uh, the child's brain as it develops when they are actually fed high uh, sweeteners you can highlight a bit more on on the brain development and addiction that it can cause oh i think the internet oh we have lost him <laughs> while we are waiting for him um it's so lovely to see all of you hello dr hans <laughs> nice to see you Sure, we'll have him back. Yeah, he is back. Just need to find. Welcome back. Hi, I, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, it was it, it blew our minds. That's what happened. Yes, and I got that yeah. with it. I think I don't know how much you heard there, but um, I was coming to, to the last point, which is to say that these alternative sweeteners tend to have their own problems and gut microbiome being one of them because they're not, the reason why they're, they don't um, provide calories is because they're not absorbed. And if they're not absorbed, that means they're stuck in the gut, which means the um, bacteria in your gut end up um, breaking them down and causing and growing different types of bacteria that will thrive on them. And studies are showing that they can alter the gut microbiome. And uh, if, we, if you are mentioning uh, these microbiome changing uh, sugars, well, one of them, and Erica, do re remind me, please. Trichalose? Oh. Yes, trichalose. Trichalose is actually uh, a two glucose molecule which is a very stable molecule that is added to ice creams and frozen foods um which really scared me to know that 
uh, it actually increases Clostridium difficile, one of the bacteria that we treat in emergency medicine on a regular basis. Um, and this uh, bacteria increased uh, in 2000 um, when trichalose was uh, mass produced. It's a really uh, important information, especially since a lot of our hospitals do uh, possibly serve uh, ice cream and frozen food to our patients. And I think it would be important for all of all of the patients, but also physicians to know. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about trichalose? Yeah, so trihalose is um, three glucose molecules joined together. So um, sucrose, regular table sugar, is glucose connected to fructose. Um, two glucoses joined together is called maltose, which you've also probably heard of or seen, but three joined together is called trihalose or trio, trio glucose. Um, it's not you, it's used. So the food industry discovered that when it used some of that sugar in ice cream, it was very convenient for them because it made it made the ice cream softer and more scoopable. Um, so that that was their motivation. Um, so that's why you you know, look out for it on those frozen products. Um, but so so it's it's still an absorbed sugar, so it's still caloric. So it's not a non-caloric sweetener. It's it, 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 it's a it still provides calories and sweetness, but it's it's kind of a convenience thing for the food industry. Uh, and that study was pretty scary because they found a pretty clear link. Again, it's difficult to show actual definitive cause and effect, um, but the, the data was pretty clear. And one another thing that I think is very important to highlight is that um, when we are consuming um, low calorie sugars, is sweeteners is that unfortunately insulin uh, still is released and sugars from our bloodstream is uh, absorbed into cells which results practically speaking in the person actually becoming more hungry than they were before so the more we eat it the more hungry we become is that the case totally yeah that's that's the case um so when when you consume these sweeteners they still activate the sweet taste receptors around the body the sweet taste receptors are in the brain or in the pancreas in the gut and um, when sweetness uh, when the sweetness receptor gets activated just as you say the body is thinking oh there's sugar coming in there's glucose coming in i'm going to take the glucose out of the blood and and use it for energy because the body doesn't want a lot of glucose to build up um, so that's where insulin comes in and insulin triggers the extraction of that glucose for energy. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Only the glucose is not there because it wasn't glucose you consumed. It was sucralose, which wasn't absorbed. Um, so it's tricking this body into thinking there's sh sugar there for energy. And then you become hypoglycemic and hungry and end up seeking out more calories. So that's another reason why individuals consuming sweeteners end up eating more calories throughout the day. At the, at the point of consumption of the actual item, there's less calories, but we have to think of this more long-term over a day or a week or a month. And the studies show those individuals consume more calories. And just to touch on the addictive nature of sugar and um, how these um, uh, sweeteners, at, at uh, add to the problem of children's addiction to sugar. Um, does it? Uh, can you support that information with um, that the brain actually becomes more addictive the more these sweeteners they eat? Yeah, and it's not just children. Of course, we're talking about children and adults. Um, and you know, whether or not you want to call sugar addictive is up to you. It's a point of debate and contention, but the facts that we do know are that sugar meets many or almost all of the criteria for addiction. So things that are addictive are defined as things that are hard to give up, uh, things that when you do give them up cause side effects, withdrawal, cravings, headaches, um, grumpiness. 
So all you know, whenever if you if you ever try to give up sugar completely, you get all of those things. Typically, they're short lived, and I think in the book we talk about managing that. Um, so it meets many of the criteria for addiction according to the official clinical diagnosis. So that for me is enough to uh, believe that it has addictive properties. Thank you. So just to sum up on it, um, it's, we, have to, we don't know enough uh, about uh, sweeteners. Um, it can trigger um, addictive uh, behaviors as associated with sugars um, as per the definition. And also, um, we just have to have further data with the, regards to the microbiome, uh, which is a very new topic uh, and research topic. So thank you. Erica, I'll hand over the interview to you now. Thank you, Linda. Um, just, just on that point um, earlier that we were talking about um, eating sugar um, and kind of, um, so, sorry, low calorie sweeteners, and as they're not being registered as calories in our brain, actually, it, in your book, you talked about regular consumption of this actually erodes our overall ability to sense caloric intake. And the brain no longer associates eating or drinking anything sweet with actually receiving calories. I mean, that's very striking to me and quite scary. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I, I think so. The biology is pretty clear. Um, there's no, I don't know about the UK, but in the US, there's no actual um, official recommendation or recognition. I mean, all these products do receive FDA approval or grass approval. They're generally recognized as safe, so food companies can use them. Uh, but those, you know, those are based on toxicity studies. Um, so for something to be used in a food, <clears throat> they have to demonstrate that it's not toxic. But that doesn't mean to say there's not some long term subtle effect uh, over time. And that's, as Linda was saying, that's where we lack the information in terms of the longer term chronic effects um, of consuming these these products. <clears throat> when there's a very simple alternative, and that's just to use less sugar. Just why can't we just have sodas with 20 or 30 percent less sugar in them? And there's an easy way to do that at home. You know, you, you, you can buy a, a, a bottle of juicer soda and just dilute it and yeah. cut, cut down the sugar that way. But food companies that aren't doing that, they're just adding these sweeteners. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's because we, we do develop this kind of preference for sweetness that you talked about in the book. And this preference for sweetness occurs so early on, even when we're still in the womb. Um, and this, it's meant to be a protective mechanism for our infants so that they have the preference for breast milk. And when they're weaning that they don't pick up bitter, poisonous food to eat. Um, I mean, it, we don't really have so much of a, you know, problem in, in, I guess, in the US and in the UK about children just picking, you know, food off the, off the ground because they don't live out in nature. Um, and this protective mechanism has stopped being protective for us and it kind of amplifies the problem um, for this sweetness preference in this sugar saturated um, or sweetness saturated food industry that we're in. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the, connecting those dots for me was um, very uh, motivating and very influential. Again, to come back to the first question in terms of getting this story out, because that's that realization is exactly the case where we're born with a built-in preference for sweetness it's supposed to be protective but it's backfiring in today's uh food environment that's you know that's 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 a problem um food and food companies are kind of hooking children on they're hijacking that preference that they know about 
by making things sweeter um, and getting them hooked on product early in life. So I think it's a real problem. And then, you know, once consumed, that sh sugar becomes more problematic during growth and development because of the developmental process that we talked about. So, yeah, I think it's a big issue. Yeah, on, on that point about the developmental process, not only does it encourage our stem cells to develop into fat cells, but it also affects the our organ development and it may even have long term um, effects on our brain development, predisposing people to um, earlier cognitive early cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, even from consumption of sugar early in, in life. Is that is that true? Yeah, studies have shown that high children consuming more sugars perform less well on standardized test scores, for example, uh, are less likely to make healthy choices faced with it. And again, that's not that's not to say that all sugar is harmful. Yeah, there's certainly you know a threshold. We we don't have enough information from research to know exactly what that threshold is, uh, but clearly sugar consumption is going up and there's a major segment of the population in the higher level. So we just need to kind of get sugar consumption back down to a more uh, sensible, healthy level so we can avoid some of those effects. Mm. And um, talking about sort of um, brain, brain health as well um, and we know that mental health problems are on the rise, especially things like depression and anxiety. Um, and in the UK, I think in 2018, um, a survey done by MIND, the charity MIND, showed that 40% of GP consultations in the UK involve mental health. And I particularly liked what you said in the book about we're not just what we eat, but we should also be telling our kids you feel how you eat. Can you elaborate more on that point? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I, th I think um, there's actually, there's not a lot of research on this. So we, we, we summarize, summarize it all in the book uh, and clearly there are links. I mean, you all parents out there, I don't, Eric and Linda, are you, are you parents, do you have kids? <laughs> No, so, well, we, so more, we work with a lot of them. <laughs> we work with kids, yeah. So, you know, most parents will see that every day, will see their kids' behavior change based on what they've consumed or not consumed, um, time or, 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 or the timing of the food. So clearly how kids re behave and respond is affected by the, by what they eat. Every, every parent knows about uh, sugar meltdowns after after going to a birthday party or sugar meltdowns after having too much sugar all at once. Um, so you can go from bouncing off the wall on a sugar high to rolling around the floor on a sugar low. And, and that's those two emotional extremes, you know, can be linked to the sugar in your blood, which is related to the sugar that you consume. Now there's a healthy middle point um, where we can try and moderate those extreme highs and extreme lows. Um, I think getting kids to be more aware of their, you know, the why, why you're bouncing off the wall, why you're rolling on the floor. Um, I think the more, more we can get kids to recognize that, the more we can, they can help themselves to, to, to moderate. Now, obviously that's very age dependent, um, but, there's certainly a role there for, for, for increased awareness. And actually, you said rightly in the book as well that, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, we see our children as being maybe a bit grumpy, lacking in concentration and things like that. And we just assumed that, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's the kid uh, and you don't think more about it. Um, and in our sugar saturated environment, 
it may actually be the sh sugar or um, these uh, low calorie sweeteners causing the issues that we're not particularly aware of. So actually, we don't really know what our kids are like without sugar. Yeah, you can find out when we talk about that. Oh, <laughs> I think we lost him again. I think there is so much information in this discussion that the internet's just going, ah, can't, <laughs> can't handle this. <laughs> It is. It is fascinating, yeah. though, um, what we have learned from this incredible uh, from this incredible book. Um, just to think about the high fructose corn syrups, the industrial mix sweetener. I love that chapter where they, he explained how corn is, of course, turned into glucose and then the glucose is then converted to fructose. And the reason why um, uh, high uh, fructose corn syrup sweetened uh, products and fast food uh, additives and in uh, highly processed foods became cheaper is because in seven, 1957 they increased the they increased the tax on on local produce sugars uh, to 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 make sure that they protect the sugar production and the price of this um, HFCS um, products actually dropped. So processed food became much cheaper in the 1950s than non-processed foods at that time. And that made it so much more accessible to the public as a whole. And um, these, these are the times when we started seeing chronic disease of uh, skyrockets, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Obesity, um, heart disease, diabetes, um, as we have learned from Dr. Hans here, who have joined us today, and how we can protect. Um, what are what are we have? What do we have to look at to protect our patients and ourselves from chronic disease? So, um, yeah. there's so much that we have learned there, right? No, absolutely, and it just also reminds me this drawing the, a parallel with uh, chronic disease and our risk factors is that we see children after you know we we talk about a sugar high right you know people get children going to a birthday party coming back or hyper or or something we and i just said you know we don't really know what our kids are like without the sugar um and it's same in chronic disease we we know that things like you know smoking, eating uh, saturated fat, uh, and and things like that can contribute to um, chronic disease. Yet, as physicians and clinicians, we don't think about what you know how our patients would be like without them. I don't know if I'm making the point. You know, Absolutely, as as uh, Professor has pointed it out, it has become the norm. Um, our kids and our patients uh, having chronic disease have definitely become the norm. And that's the baseline that we are starting at, isn't it, Professor? Yes, I'm sorry, I, you lost me again. Um, okay. My network just decided to die, of course, right at the critical moment. <laughs> um, but I'm back on with a hot spot from my phone, so the quality might not be as good, but Yes. So we are talking about the hyperactive, moody, and angry, sleepy, hungry child, and um, yes. how how has how this has become our norm now. And I think a lot of mental health issues are being diagnosed, misdiagnosed, because uh, we don't any longer know what is the norm. Is is that what you have found as well? Yeah, and there's a there's a simple thing you can do before you go down that path. I mean, there there might be an underlying issue uh, that might need um, more careful attention or medication or whatever. But but I would say before you go down that path, one thing you could do is just try to take sugar out. And it's been our experience in a lot of cases working with families that when you take sugar out. Um, with our seven day challenge. And again, we're not saying to give up all sugar forever. It's just take it out for seven days. Just you'll learn a lot. 
you'll see what things are like without sugar and start from that. So it's like a reset. It's like a complete computer control, all delete reboot. Yeah. Um, I mean, on, on that point, actually, um, it, it just reminded me about what you talked about, fructose malabsorption as well, that we see so many children these days with abdominal pain and unexplained abdominal pain, especially me in primary care. Um, and given that, you know, this, this month this is our gut health month um could could we just you know touch on touch on why why fructose um, malabsorption comes to be and and why that causes a problem in children's guts yeah i mean that's another another good great point there was, there was a great study done um that showed that i think it was over 50 percent of kids with unexplained abdominal issues ended up having fructose malabsorption. Um, and when, when parents just took sugar out for a week or two, the, the, um, the, the issues went away. Um, so the thing I didn't talk about when I talked about fructose is that there's, a, there, there's another problem with fructose is that there's only a limited amount of fructose that can be absorbed. Um, and kids lack that ability to absorb, which could be a protective thing um, because for glucose, for example, there's like a dozen different transport molecules that will be activated to transport glucose from the gut into the blood. For fructose, there's only one it's called GLUT5, but um, kids don't always have, kids slowly develop that. So if you haven't fully developed your, GLU, your GLUT5 receptor, you can't absorb the fructose and you get fructose malabsorption. So it's, it's, it, it's not uncommon. And the easy way to find out if you have it or not is just to take sugar out and or especially fructose. If you're drinking a lot of apple juice, for example, um, just take it out and see if those symptoms go away. And in, in infants, newborn infants as well, they don't even possess that ability to process fructose if, if they are, you know, taking in some fructose from mum's breast milk, um, un, you know, un, unknowingly from from mum as well. That's right. Uh, we're not born with the GLUT5 um, receptor turned on. It only gets turned on later in life as, as more fructose gets consumed. Mm -hmm. So even small amounts coming into the baby could, could could cause that problem. So, um, we've I mean we've we've covered a lot today. Um, I think we would definitely would love to have you and also Dr. Emily Ventura on um, with us again um, to dive into some of these issues in in even more detail. Um, so, I wondered if you can. With, with your experience of working with children and family, give us um, some idea of how we can address this sugar overconsumption. As we said uh, earlier, that we don't want to scare people in saying, you know, you cannot have any sugar at all, um, but um, to raise awareness of actually too much sugar is causing um, actually a whole host of problems. So how can we reduce that? Um, and it's not just sugar, but also uh, sweeteners um, and low calorie sweeteners, be it artificial or natural. Um, and they yep. can be so hidden under the 200, I think it's 262 different names that, um, and I've dropped the link that you, you um, shared with us in the book, in the chat. Um, for anyone who's interested to have a look. Um, so um, how, how can we address this issue um, and how, what are the tips on cutting down on sugar in, intake? Yeah, yeah, so the, I mean, the, the second half of the book is really all about that. Um, and I think we have, we have dozens and dozens of different strategies and recipes. And, and meal plan. So, and a lot of it depends on where, you know, where you are on the spectrum and what's going to work for you. This is all very personal and individual. So um, 
one of the first things you can do is find all those hidden sugars. That's one big, big, good way to start making a change is um, look for hidden sugars in your pantry right now. Um, check your peanut butter, your tomato sauces, your ketchups, salad dressings, frozen foods um, for hidden sh sugars, uh, sugars that you didn't even know was there, breads, even crackers. There's just, um, food industry puts those things in there to mask the taste of all the preservatives. Um, so they, be, they tend to be more processed foods. So just by finding healthier varieties without those added sugars, you can make a big, a big impact and just become more aware. Look for the usual culprits. So if you or your kids are drinking a lot of soda or a lot of juice, you know, that's, that's typically the main major culprit in a lot of households. So look for ways to try and cut that down. And there's two ways to do that. Well, there's multiple ways to do it, but they fall between the extreme of uh, cutting it out completely and just gradually cutting it out. Uh, so the seven day plan would, 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 would go for seven days without added sugar. And it's this reset that I mentioned earlier. So if your kids are drinking a lot of apple juice and you're trying to cut that down, just don't buy it at the grocery store. Um, if you find that's too difficult, then dilute it. Next time you're serving it at breakfast, start with 75, 25, go to 50, 50. Breakfast is typically a big issue for kids. Typically breakfast is a pretty sugar loaded meal, um, but there's lots of tips in the books of how to re-pivot that towards less sugar and more fiber, more protein. So what did you have for breakfast this morning? Let me, you know, Think of ways to transition that to less sugar. So if you like a piece of toast, you don't have to put tons of jam on it. You can have eggs on toast or nut butter on toast or avocado smashed on toast. Don't have to put syrups on pancakes. If you are making pancakes, put more fiber in the batter, add more protein in the batter, add an extra egg, egg white, for example. The more you can add protein and fiber, you can offset some of these effects of sugars as well. So sugar, food pairings is, is, is important. And then in terms of cooking or baking, in the, in the book, we have 39 recipes and on our website, sugarproofkids.com, you'll see you know dozens more recipes. We just released a recipe for sugarproof Nutella. All kids love Nutella, I love Nutella. Um, not to say you can never have Nutella ever again, but there's a sugar-proof version we, that Emily came up with the recipe that makes uh, chocolate hazelnut spread without added sugars. Um, so in our, in our recipes, we challenged ourselves to find everyday foods that kids love and see if we could make them without added sugars. Another one would be uh, blueberry muffins, um, cornbread, cakes, um, healthy treats without added sugar. So there's lots of creative ways and we're, we're, we're just trying to, you know, shift, shift the mindset that, that, that treat foods, that fun foods don't have to be loaded with sugar. There's other ways to do it without added sugar. So there's just so many ways. I could talk all day about all the different strategies. Yes. Yeah, so how much have, do you get the kids involved in this? Like how how get, do you motivate them? That's that's. I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, the first the first chapter in the second part of the book starts off with how to talk to kids. Um, so I think that's really important point not to overlook. And again, that's going to be very age dependent. We want kids to be internally motivated. Um, we don't want to go to our kids and say, okay, if you don't eat sugar, I'll give you extra pocket money or I'll give you an extra toy. That those external rewards will work in the short term, but then you're, you'll end up paying your kids for life just to eat healthy. We, we want them to be internally driven. So you have to talk to kids on their level to find out what motivates them, what fires them up. You, know, you might be fired up as a parent 
but different things will be firing up your kids and we need to kind of talk to them on their level to find out what that is and then work with that. Could be, if your kids are older, it could be healthier skin, fitting into a new pair of jeans, doing better at school, running faster in soccer. You know, there could be any number of different factors, but you have to find out what that is. Also, when I spoke to my nephew about it, we go rock climbing together and he, of course, was asking, could I have a treat for as a uh, Fanta as my treat? And um, I sat down and I looked in, into his eye and I just spoke to him with respect and love and just explained to him why it would be harmful for him. And um, he understood. He's only seven years old and he was like, okay, I understand maybe I shouldn't have Fanta. And I think often we underestimate our kids uh, and we try to go around it, but often just telling them what it is and why it's harmful, they understand. Um, at least I found it with my nephew and some of my patients that they are more than happy to have a discussion as long as we respect them and show that uh, we value their opinion. Um, and mm -hmm. I think it mm -hmm. helps not only kids, but of course adults and vice versa, um, rather than just telling them no or yes, or or yes, um, paying them off for a while. But certainly a good conversation is to be had first, I think. Yeah, I think that, you know, that, that's the perfect age for that kind of conversation. You know, little, little older, they might be too set in their ways. A little younger might not get that. So, it's, so, so again, the, the, the script is a little different depending depending on the age but yeah kids are pre very resilient you know in our seven day no no sugar challenge the first few days are going to be rough you're going to you know have a little could have a little rebellion on your hands um, um, kids could be grumpy head achy without sugar but you have to get through those first few days and then typically they'll, they'll, they'll come out of that stronger, and better, you may bring in a new jar of peanut butter without added sugar, they may spit it out at you and say, this is terrible, I hate this even more, but after a day or two, they'll be perfectly fine with it. It's just not what they're used to, but they can easily get over that. Absolutely, and uh, your book, Sugar Proof Guys, if you haven't read it, please do buy it for the goodness of your family. And um, it's full of just practical, aspects of what you can do uh the second half of the book is as you mentioned there is the seven day challenge and uh, followed by loads of amazing recipes uh, that you can uh challenge your your kids to cook with and just have a good time uh, while teaching them on how to live a long and fulfilling life. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are adding your links, uh, Sugarproof and your Amazon, Facebook and Instagram links into the chat. And also if you're watching us on YouTube, we will have it in the comments. We really hope that we can have you in the future for another afternoon tea to address many, many more issues that you have had highlighted in the book. Thank you so much for writing this book. We have learned so much from it. And we hope that all of our colleagues and patients will have access to this life-changing information. Um, if you guys are new to us and would like to join, you can become a member at Afternoon Tea just to com continue the conversation on how you can add health to your life every day. It's completely free. Um, the links to our um, a website, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram can be found again in the chat. Once again, thanks for joining us. Now we're going to go off and um, have our 30 minute session uh, with our incredible guest to have a few private questions uh, that you have for him. So thanks very much for joining again and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. We have learned so much.